You're listening to The Voluntary Life, where you can hear ideas for finding freedom in an unfree world. Visit thevoluntarylife.com to connect with the show and hear all past episodes. Here's your host, Jake. Hi, it's Jake here. Welcome to The Voluntary Life. I'm very pleased to have a special guest on the show today. It is Lorette Lynn, the host of Unplugged Mum. Hi, Lorette. Hello, Jake. How are you? I'm good, thanks. How are you doing? Very good. I'm happy to be here. I'm really pleased to have you on the show. I, I, I see your, your site and your show and, and the sort of resources that you're putting out there as a, uh, you know, a, a great resource for an alternative approach to both parenting and education. And I wonder if for the listeners who aren't familiar with Unplugged Mum, if you could just summarize you know, sort of what, what this, the site is about for you, what the show is about for you. Sure. Well, Unplugged Mom is focused around the radio show, Unplugged Mom Radio. Uh, On the site, we do have articles and information that we provide as a resource for our listeners that listen to the radio show. And the radio show is about, like you said, parenting in an alternative way and especially focused on educating outside of school. And we can call it uh, home education or school-free education, but basically the idea is being able to learn through life without the intrusion of school because I believe that we all learn naturally and we're supposed to learn without school intervention um, and that there is a distinction between schooling and education so that we can embrace education and get our quality, a better quality education through life without interference or intrusion from school because I don't think that that process is healthy for children. I don't think that it's the process has been healthy for families, and I think a lot of the other uh, plagues that we suffer uh, financially and economically and socially and in our in our family structure and just the breakdown of uh, so many uh, social political problems that are happening all start at some particular root. Mm -hmm. And the root is how we are indoctrinated into this process society, and it happens when we're children. So that's why the show focuses a lot on that. We do talk about alternative living in other ways, uh, alternative parenting, health and wellness. We talk about the economy and political activism, but everything is mainly focused on uh, children and how to keep them safe from intrusion and indoctrination. So the show Unplugged Mom Radio, the name Unplugged, is like a tongue-in-cheek reference to the Matrix. So we're all being unplugged from the artificial process of life. I think that's great. I mean, I'm really interested in in that approach because I I don't have kids. And, you know, but if we do um, have kids in future, something that we've looked at is this whole idea of unschooling, basically. And I think for people listening to to this show, to The Voluntary Life, the kind of subjects that we cover, entrepreneurship and unjobbing and financial freedom and, you know, ways of finding freedom in your own life. I think this approach to, you know, um, to school and kids and what to do about that whole question is really fascinating. And I think for people listening to the show, I'm sure a lot of people would feel the way that I felt about school, which is that you know, for me, school was like being in prison. I, I, I really did not enjoy the whole experience. It was, it was horrible. Um, and most of the time, it was also just really boring. But I think for a lot of people um, who think about this subject, they probably, even those who, who think, you know, school was, was really bad, they probably think, as I did, even a couple of years ago, School is, you know, my school was really bad. I went to a lot of state schools and they were very rough as well. And, and some, some of them were quite violent. So that was a really bad situation. But my, my thoughts on this a couple of years ago were that, well, you know, OK, so much better to go to, if, if we have kids then we can send them to, you know, a private school, which is um, has better resources and, you know, better atmosphere and so forth. But school overall is just one of those things that is kind of like, well, You've got to put up with it. It's one of those things that's part of life. It may not be good, but it's sort of, uh, you know, it's a bit like sort of the roads or, you know, the public infrastructure. It's like, what are you going to do? You're going to go and live in the woods or something? And, and you know, the approach that you're taking is, is, I think, to actually see a positive way beyond that, which is to say that, you know, there, that to, to really question not just sort of the quality of the school, but the whole idea of school itself. Is, is that right? 
Yeah, absolutely right. It's to question the whole idea of school itself. And it's interesting that you brought up the school prison relation because it, it really is, if you compare the two and look beyond just the academics and you compare what's going on there, you uh, students in school, just like prisoners in a prison, don't really have a say in how their lives are run. You're taught to sit on command and stand on command and walk on command and be silent on command, and you're taught to just absor absorb this uh, pre pre determined and prescribed information that's supposed to be just downloaded into you uh, almost intravenously, intellectual intravenous, you know, and you, you're not supposed to question it. You're not supposed to challenge it. You're supposed to just absorb it and then regurgitate it on command, and that's how it is. Now, when you talk about school being the norm, I challenge parents to ask the deeper question and look beyond that. Like on my show, we don't talk about home education in so far as uh, how to teach math or the academics. We do. We do provide those resources for parents and we do have some shows that focus on the academics in home education like once you've unplugged how to go forward now mm. but the focus of the the whole endeavor is to really probe and ask the deeper question now you were talking about the fact that even though school sucks we still think well what are we going to do it's the norm this is just what you have to do so maybe we'll do uh private school mm. so you have better uh, a better experience. But I really, really want to encourage parents to take it a step further than that. Really think about why you think school is the norm, because that's what happens. They say, okay, well, I don't like it, but what else am I going to do? Mm. And my question is, why do you think that way? Why do you feel that way? Take it back a couple of hundred years or even 150 years. Families didn't feel that way. They didn't just compulsively send their child off to school. Mm. They, it, it was something that some people did, but not all people. And when they did, it wasn't a state-run school. It was usually a very, uh, it, they kept it in the community. It was a community-run, like, you know, the old red schoolhouse type of thing where the parents were very involved in what was going on there. And it was not this big uh, corporate monster that it really is now, that it has political, it carries political and corporate interest in the school. So it's it's a, just a completely different atmosphere. Nowadays, it's just this compulsive action that people take without any thought. They get married, they have a couple of kids, they send the kids to school. The school, the kids become indoctrinated, they get out of that system, go through the same procedure, figure, well, I have to now I have to go to college and now I have to get good grades so I could get a good job, so I could get a the nice office in the corner and I could get the, the good benefits and the good pay and then I'm gonna have a couple of kids and send them right back into the system. And it's just this perpetual wheel that keeps spinning and we end up on in debt and we end up owing our half of our lives to bank loans and uh, we're just these obedient consumers and television watching people that really are, are just walking around in this perpetual circle like a hamster in a wheel and we keep putting our kids back into it. So the question is, why? Mm -hmm. Why do we feel that, well, that's just what you do? Because that's the answer I get a lot too. When, when I ask people, why are you sending your kids to school? And they look at me, because if you ask a home educating parent why are you home educating, they have an answer for you. Right, right. They have a, they've made a decision. They have a definite answer. But if you ask a parent of a, a kid that goes to school, whether it be public or private school, why does your kid go to school? Not that school, but to school in general. They just look at you blankly and they say, what do you mean? Mm, yeah. I, it's, just, it's just what you do. My question is why? Why do you feel that? Well, it's just what you do. And the answer, Jake, is because we have been conditioned to believe that is just what you do. But it's not. Mm -hmm. It's unnatural. It is not natural to separate yourself from your child when the child is three or four years old and say, I have no idea how to educate you. So I'm going to hand you over to this system of strangers that I really don't know that much about because I just can't do it. I don't know how to do it. Yeah, and It's unnatural that. for a parent to feel that way. It's, it's almost a little bit insane. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think that um, for me, you know, thinking back on your question, why? I think it definitely comes from, you know, the ex having gone through that sort of treadmill that you talk about and that just being so embedded as, as an experience that is sort of part of my life that, that, you know, up until quite recently, I didn't really even question, as I said, I questioned the quality of it, but not the system itself. And I think the underlying thought that people will have um, if I try and sort of think about the way I would have expressed it is, yeah, school is 
um, school can be a horrible experience. So, you know, the parents need to find a good school and one that is, you know, very nice to the kids and, and so on and so on. I'm sure you could find a lot of ways of justifying the school experience by choosing a nicer school. But the other thing that I think would come up is people would say, well, as a parent, you know, I have an obligation to, and then you can insert the phrasing here, but it's something along the lines of like, make sure my child is capable and prepared for the world that they live in and the world that they're going into and they need an education because an education, as you said, you know, you, you can't get a job without an education. So you've got to go and get, got to go to school. Otherwise you will be, you know, your child would be sort of marginalized and left out and not able to um, have a place in this school-based world that we live in. And I wonder if you could talk about, you know, your your view of of that that sort of um, justification or argument that I'm sure a lot of people have in their minds. Yeah, well, the, that is one of the most popular arguments for school is that people will say, I know it's not a, a wonderful experience and I know that the quality of education has declined, especially in the United States, but they need an education. Or, but, the another one is, but they need to learn how to socialize and make friends. Or, but they need to be prepared for the real world. And I realize that the people that are saying this really believe that there's some merit and some value to what they're saying. But if you, again, if you really take it another level deeper and really think about where those statements are coming from, these are preconditioned responses. Mm -hmm. Because we believe, we associate education with school. We associate a child's social life with school. We associate their preparing for the real world with school. My question then is, why do we make those associations? Where did those associations come from? How did we come to associate education with school and not only associate education with school, but actually get to a place where we believe that that is the only place in which a person can receive an education right. or ex I want to say experience an education because education is not something that somebody just puts on you. Education is a, a personal experience. So why do we think that school is the only place where that can happen? You know, that's very interesting. When you really think about the question, it's very interesting. And it's a very interesting look at human psychology because the fact that so many people, they hear education, they think chalkboards and teachers. Mm. That's it. They, the mental association is made, and that's all there is to it. So when somebody steps outside of that, they view it as abnormal or alternative. That's why parents that educate without school or families that educate without school are seen as fringe or alternative or strange mm. because it, it messes with the preconceived notions of how we think life should be. But if we really think about it, Jake, especially in today's day and age when we have access to communication in the way that we do and we can bridge communication between countries in the way that we do and, you know, just anything is available at our fingertips, the educational experience is everywhere everywhere and mostly outside of the classroom. And I would even go so far as to say with certainty that the educational experience nowadays inside the classroom pales in comparison to what the educational experience is outside of the classroom in the real world. Now, as far as preparing children for the real world, my fir the first thing I want to bring up, the first point I want to bring up is what is real? When we say, I want to prepare my child for the real world, what are we talking about? Define real world. What is that? And a lot of times people, they don't know. They, they don't know exactly how to define it. And they say, well, you know, you know what I mean? And I say, no, I don't know what you mean. Explain it to me. What, do you, what is the real world that they're preparing for? And they say, well, you know, they got to graduate and they have to get a job. Okay, you have to graduate, you have to get a job. And then everything starts to unfold. And you get a job and, you know, you want to get a higher paying job. So you get a job in the nicer office or the nicer position or a management job. And you get to wear a tie to work every day so that you can make more money. And why do we need more money? Well, we need more money because we want to buy more stuff. The more money we have, the more stuff we can get. And the more stuff we get, the more stuff we want. So now we have credit card debt. And we need to build up our credit. Why do we need to build up our credit? So we could get a good mortgage, so we could get a nice big house. Because we don't actually want to own the house. We want the bank to own the house while we live in it. Because the bigger it is, the better it is. Because it's all about status. Who trained us that way? Why is that the real world? 
And Jake, if that is somebody's definition of the real world, this perpetual cycle of uh, consumerism and debt and being in financial stress, if that is what we define as the real world, then yes, yeah, school is the place to train us for that because that's what it has done. It has trained us for that environment. And so many of us are stuck in that environment. And we think we're happy, but we're not. Because we have, I, I think this latest statistic is one in five adults are on some kind of psychotropic medication just to get them through the day. And we have social anxiety disorder and depression and everything else. It's because we have been trained for a life that is actually artificial. That is the artificial world. That's not real. And again, how can they prepare for the real world by spending their entire childhood locked away from the real world? Wouldn't it be better to prepare for the real world by being out here and actually living in the real world and getting our educational experience in real life situations? So kids that are educating outside of school are not learning what they need to learn from a textbook and from a canned environment. They're learning it in a lot of, a lot of times, they are learning it in hands-on ways, through community, through apprenticeships, through conversations with peers and family members and different age people, which brings me to socialization. We're out there in the real world meeting real people and it's not forced social situations because people will say that too. How's my kid going to socialize? And I say, well, we don't, we, we don't get socialized. I don't do socialization to my kids. Right. This is not something that I do to them. I know I'm going to socialize you now. You know, it's 10 o'clock. Come on. We have to go get socialized. That's not how it works. We're these human beings and human beings are social creatures and we like to meet other people and that's what we do. But they're not forced social environments where you plunk a kid into a third grade classroom and everyone else is eight years old, exactly the same age. And there's one teacher and you fold your arms and you tell the kids, go make a friend. And now they have 50 other kids to choose from. This is a forced situation. That's not a genuine relationship. Genuine relationships happen outside of that. So the experience without school is more real. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And I wanted to ask you about that because like, I, I absolutely agree with everything that you say. And I think what would be really fantastic is to hear... So, you know, what does that look like in for, from in your experience? Because I know, you know, you this is something that you not just talk about, but you actually live these principles in your own right. family. And so, you know, could you just describe for people thinking about it, what life outside the school matrix looks like, you know, in terms of, of you know, the experience of of uh, of you and your kids? Sure, sure. I don't mind doing that. And I, I have answered this question before, but I always like to preempt it with this is my experience right. from my family. Yeah. The idea is that you have to find what is going, going to work for your own family. And I just want to point out that sometimes it takes a little while before a family finds what their actual niche is. Right. Because you have to remember, we are so used to being plugged in and we are so used to this I'm going to have some kids and I'm going to put them into school, that when we break free from that, we're on kind of shaky ground for a little while because we say, okay, I'm not going to do this, but what do I do? Yeah. And parents find themselves a little bit lost and a little bit confused. And that's, also why my website, unpluggedmom.com, provides resources for parents that are in that place where they say, I don't, I don't, I don't want to do school, but what do I do? How, 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 do I, how do I live this way? The website is just chock full of resources and reviews and all sorts of materials and podcasts and everything else to help support parents in finding their own niche and finding their own, their own way. Now, that said, I will tell you what uh, my life looks like. I have three kids. And we are, uh, they're all kids right now. None of, none of them are grown yet, but none of them are babies either. So we're in kind of that like really cool phase in life where we get to, you know, not change diapers and uh, we're done with breastfeeding and that kind of thing. My youngest is seven, so, and my oldest is 10. So we're in, we're in a really fun phase of our life. Now, as far as uh, academics, I don't really classify us uh, homeschoolers or unschoolers or anything. And I just have this... Uh, repulsion to any kind of classification because I think when you name when you go out of your way to name what you're doing outside of school it automatically viol uh, validates school as being the norm right, so you, right. you have to name what you're doing outside of it it's people that go to the school don't call themselves schoolers they just right. think they're normal so it normalizes that paradigm okay so mm -hmm. if someone asks me I like to just say that we don't go to school because we don't need it and that's that right, all right, right. Um, we do spend 
part of the day, not every day, but we do spend some time doing what I guess others would consider actual book work or academic work, where we just put a lot of emphasis on reading and we put a lot of emphasis on uh, learning geometry and mathematics. And we follow the principles of uh, back in the days of Socrates, the uh, philosophical principles of learning uh, through the trivium. So, which is a very kind of critical thinking kind of learning, but it's, it happens very organically. It happens very naturally because it adheres to the way the human brain works. So we spend, we spend some time doing that, but a lot of our day is also spent on having conversations with each other and going places and doing things. I live right now in a community that very much supports home education. There are a lot of home educators in my community, and when there are, when you live in such a community, you automatically just see the rest of the community respond. So there are a lot of things for us to do in the libraries and community centers. There are a lot of self-initiated uh, cooperative learning experiences and social experiences that we belong to, and you know, then there's the sports and everything else. Mm -hmm. So. We'll usually have like a family breakfast and we'll talk and we'll talk about what we're doing that day or we'll have conversations. But the idea is that we're talking, we're spending time together as family. Then depending upon the day, we'll spend some more time um, doing some reading and maybe some academic work. Then maybe we'll play some games together. At some point, because the kids are older, they have free time to go and, and be with their friends or play with their friends or whatever. And, you know, the day kind of just takes care of itself and we go with the flow. Mm. Other days, we're out from 8 o'clock in the morning until 5 o'clock in the afternoon because those are the days that we're running to different kinds of sports and co-op events and um, different community activities and so on, whether it be 4-H or uh, volunteering for something else or just going to a, a community cooperative type of event for home educating families. So there's a, it, it's, it's hard to really tell you what a day in the life looks like because every day is a little bit different, sure. but we find, our, we find our flow. And as the family grows, as we grow and we change, I always try to go with the flow and say, okay, our needs are changing and our schedule is changing and I'm just gonna go with it. But the idea is that I have dedicated my life to this because I think and I think this is important for, for parents to understand because some moms will say that to me. They'll say, my gosh, you know, where do you have time for you? Mm -hmm. And I, I don't separate the two. I am my child's mother. When I gave birth to my first daughter, that's who I became. Right. That is me. I'm not, it's not like, okay, I do my kids and then I got to have time for me. Right. It's not like that. There is free time. Of course, we all need some time to be alone with our thoughts. So do the kids. But that's not what I'm talking about. I don't have two identities. I'm not Lorette the person and Lorette the mom. Lorette the person is Lorette the mom. Yeah. And I think that the, for the 20 years that my kids are in their youth, and I'm talking from the oldest to the youngest, it's going to be about 20 years. Right. I think that I can spare 20 years out of my entire life to dedicate to being a mother to my children because my personal opportunities will be there when they're grown, but they're going to grow and that's going to be it. I don't get to rewind and do that over. You know what I mean? Absolutely. I think that's awesome. So they're that's worth awesome. it. Yeah. I think that's fantastic. And I, I, I understand that every day is obviously different and, and so forth. I guess um, the, the, one of the things that I've uh, sort of read about um, in, in this sort of field is the idea of, uh, of, very much, you know, learning being a process that is natural and that is child directed in the sense that they that, you know, kids don't actually need to, to be taught how to learn, so to speak. It, it's something that if you don't get in the way of, it happens, you know, because we have as humans, we have a voracious appetite for learning and knowledge. And, you know, is is it in your family? Do, do you go from this sort of idea of that the kids learn what they want to learn and that they, you know, they're directing themselves or what, what's your view of that idea? Uh, well, we are, we do all learn naturally. Learning happens whether we want it to or not. It's just something that human beings are driven to do, to do. Babies are born and they learn. Okay. They want to, when, when you, a child, when a human being starts to grow, they start to discover their world automatically, whatever that world may be, whether it be inside of a house or out in the jungle or whatever, they will start to absorb their world. They will start to discover their world and they will want to communicate with that world and communicate what they've learned and ask questions because it's natural. It's like being thirsty or being hungry. 
Okay, you're physically thirsty, you're physically hungry, and you're also spiritually hungry because you want to, everybody has that same question. We want to understand why we're here and we seek that. And that's very primal. That's very instinctual, just like it's primal and instinctual to want to eat and want to drink. Intellectually, we all have that primal urge to want to understand our world. So it happens all by itself. Learning happens all by itself, okay? As far as when you get to the academics and being child-led or child-centered, that's when things start to get a little bit, um, I guess, difficult mm. for some parents. But here's the problem that I have for it. Again, we go back to we're looking for a method. We're looking for something to do. We're looking to call it something. Well, you know, I don't, I don't direct my child's learning. It's all child-directed learning. And, you know, we let them do whatever they want. And that, to me, that's just more process, more ways to make the whole thing unnatural. I think we're overcomplicating it when we're looking for all these different principles. We need to really understand, because we'll say, well, children learn naturally, and so therefore I do this method. And it's like self-contradictory. It doesn't make any sense. We need to really, really embrace the fact that this is just something that is natural and we need to stop overcomplicating it. And as far as like going to one extreme or the other extreme, there are parents that take it to such a level that, you know, if that's their thing, then great, uh, that's fine. But where they they will come to me and they'll say, I really think it's important that my child has a, a good foundation in mathematics, but, you know, I'm an unschooler and I will never force that. But they get themselves into a tizzy mm -hmm. and they're so nervous and they're so afraid that if they say, hey, little Susie, I think we should learn how to add now. Well, then I'm not a proper unschooler and that, that I'm a bad parent and I'm an interfering parent and that's coercion. And that drives me bananas because... We've taken it to such a level where we're afraid to be involved in our children's lives. That doesn't make any sense. A family is a family. It's a combined effort. And if you think it's important that your child learns how to read, then get involved in trying to help your child learn how to read. You don't just sit there and bite your nails and until they're 14 years old and say, gosh, I hope they pick up a book. I don't agree with that. And I don't think it's forceful or coercion to say when they're, you know, when they're ready. It has to be when they're ready, but you know your child. Some children are ready at three years old. Some aren't ready till they're eight or nine years old. You have to decide that on your own. Right. But it's okay to sit down with them and read them a book and say, Gee, honey, would you like to learn how to read this book? I can teach you how to read this book. Mm. And then you help them sound out the letters and you help them put the letters together. Now, if the child's resisting, no, don't do it. I 100% I will say that. If the child is resisting, then something isn't right. They're not ready. But if the child is open, which they're going to be because they naturally want to understand their world, they want to communicate, then it's okay to say, hey, let's go to the bookstore, pick out some books, and I will show you how to put the letters together. Once that happens, once the mechanics happen, then, yeah, they're pretty much on their own because then they could just, the world is open. Once you know how to read, you can learn anything in the whole world. Mm. But it's okay for a parent to say, look, I've been on this earth for 20 years, 25 years longer than you have, and I know that there are certain things that are kind of important, so let's explore those. It doesn't have to be in a demanding way. It doesn't have to be in a forceful way. It's simply the fact that you're a mentor to your child, and you know that there are certain things that are going to help them, just like you know that if they're making a choice between a hostess cupcake and a salad, you know which is going to be healthier. Right, Ultimately, right. you can leave the choice up to the child if you feel that you want to, but in your, in your mind and in your soul, you know which is going to be better for their body, and it's okay. So I think we need to stop overcomplicating things. I think we need to stop worrying about what we're going to do outside of school. Just disconnect, wake up in the morning, and be alive. Love your children and pay attention, and that's all. That's all the instructions you really need. You know what I mean? Yeah, I understand. I, I think I, I really get where you're coming from because what I take from what you're saying is that yes, you you know you don't um, force kids to do stuff, but there's nothing wrong with proactively taking a real interest in what your kids are learning and encouraging them and getting them involved in stuff that you think is important and that right. That's we it. don't want to create this false dichotomy where it's one end or the other. You know, either I'm sitting them down in, in like a pupil in a classroom and I'm, I'm you know, hitting their, their wrists with a yardstick and saying, you must learn your addition facts. Or 
I'm just totally like, okay, you're on your own and yeah, I'm not going to do luck. anything. <laughs> good luck. I hope you good find something you interesting and, to learn. Good luck you know, here's, I mean, because if we're really going to do that, why are we, why are we even living with them in the first place? Why don't yeah, we just no. say, okay, here you go. There's the door. Here's your hat. What's your hurry? You know what I mean? It doesn't have to be one extreme or the other. And it's psychotic to think that it has to be one extreme or the other. Yeah. You know, it's, it's in the middle somewhere. And every family has to do what's right for them. And it doesn't, we don't have to categorize ourselves. We don't have to start following some dogmatic principle. That's the idea to unplug from any dogmatic principle and just realize that this is life, mm. you know? And this, this learning just happens. And it's okay for parents to be a part of that. It's not a sin. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. I really get a, um, a strong sense, um, yeah, and, and it's really admirable hearing it in your voice and in the way that you talk about it, that, you know, your approach to this is really courageous. And I, I, I really um, respect, you know, what you're doing. And when I also, when, when you're talking about it, I was thinking about the question that stuck in my mind, the one that you posed earlier about why do people think um, that uh, school is going to pair kids for life? And I think it's linked, you know, I was, I was thinking about that question. I think that, that really what's going on for people is that there's a lot of fear from the parents um, about uh, fitting in and about social ostracism and about being considered, you know, weirdo outsiders um, and neglectful parents and being judged and so forth. That I, I think that, you know, what I get from the way that you, you are talking about your experience is that, you know, you, you have found a lot of courage to do something that goes against a lot of conditioning that I'm sure you also received in your mm -hmm. childhood. And what I think would be really helpful is I wonder if you can say something about, you know, how you overcame some of the anxiety and fear that I'm sure people experience when going outside, you know, going against the grain in this way. Yeah, I, d I did. I experienced a lot of anxiety, a lot of fear, and a lot of social ostracism as well because I live in a community that embraces home education right now. And there are a lot of home educating families in this community, which, which is one of the reasons why I chose to move here. Right. When I originally made the decision, though, I lived in New York City. I was born and raised in New York City. Um, and there are not just the way the political structure is, I guess, or the social environment is in New York. Uh, also, the laws, the, your, the laws are very restrictive on home educating families in New York. Right. So there are not a lot of home educating families there. And when I made the decision 10 years ago, there were even less because it's, it's growing. Mm. Um, but at the time, there were even less. And I didn't, I didn't know anybody. I did not make the decision because I knew families that home educated. I made the decision because I read it in a magazine. And I thought, well, I'd like to do this because I could not decide where to send my daughter to school. But I was suffering from that same preconditioned compulsive action where, okay, well, my daughter's three. She was three. And when I think about that now, I think about she was a baby. Mm. She was three. And I was getting ready to separate myself from her, whether she liked it or not, whether I liked it or not, because that's what you do. And you put her into the school. The one thing that I did differently, and I was always a little bit different in my life. If I wasn't at least a little bit different, I don't think I'd be here today. But the one, the one thing that I did differently was I went to the school and I said, all right, well, my daughter's going to be coming here in September, so what do you got planned? And right away, something didn't seem right to me because the administrator kind of blinked at me a few times and said, what, what do you mean? And I said, well, what are they going to be learning? What are they going to be doing? And she said, oh, uh, and she stumbled around a little bit, and she said, you know, you're really just supposed to fill out the forms. And I'm like, okay, well, what if I don't like this school? And she said, well, this is your district. This is where you live. Wow. And that's when things started to like seem a little fuzzy in my mind. And I said, I could send her to a private school. And she rolled her eyes and she said, well, if you think that's going to help. And I said, can you please just tell me what the curriculum is, you know? So this, we're talking about pre-K here, right? So she said, they're going to learn their numbers and they're going to learn how to count to 10. And, you know, we learn the alphabet. So I said, okay, well, my daughter already knows that. So, and she said, what do you mean? And I said, how could any, I, it didn't make sense to me that, this was a this was different. Mm. I didn't understand why they, this was different. That my daughter knew her alphabet. Because going back to what I was saying before, we're hungry and we're thirsty for knowledge when we're born. 
Okay. I spent time with my daughter. I read her books, so she very naturally pointed to the letters and, and kind of just discovered them on her own. And I would say, oh, that's A, oh, that's B, and A is for Apple. And she picked it up. There was no force. To me, it was just as natural as teaching her to use the potty or how to eat with, with a fork. It just came naturally. It was something she was interested in doing, so I followed it. And she was interested in, you know, we were playing together, and I would count one, two, three, and she would giggle, and she would count. It just all came very naturally. So I said, well, she already knows that. So what becomes of her? Do you put her in a grade ahead or how does that work? And she said, no, no, no. She just has to uh, conform. That's the word she used. She wow. just has to conform to what the other students are doing because it's important that they stay with their own age. And I said, why is that important? And she said, well, for social reasons, we have to have them socialize with kids their own age. And I said, I, why? I didn't understand. And the more questions I asked, the more annoyed the school administrator got. Mm. And I think that annoyed me. I'm just asking questions here. I did the same thing in, in church a few years prior. So I was kind of used to irritating people, you right, know? Right. <laughs> and I said, yeah, I don't think, I, I, I don't like this. I don't like this. So I told my husband and he said, all right, check out some of the private schools. Because at this point we were like, well, we got to do something because yeah. you got to go to school, right? Yeah. So I started to check out the private schools and it was kind of just more of the same, but they were charging money this time. Right. <laughs> you know? And I said, well, the, the facility's nicer and it's prettier and it smells better. And, it, you know, it's certainly uh, the uniforms are, are nicer, but it's just when you cut down to it, it's just more conformity. And I don't really think I dig this. And I started to get stressed out, Jay, because I said, I don't know what to do. Mm. I then I got a magazine. I was subscribed to Mothering Magazine at the time. And there was an article on the front cover about home education from a dad's perspective, which was very different. And I read it and I said, this is it. This is for us. And I didn't know a soul that did it. I eventually started to meet other families that were interested in home education in my area, but there were like five of us that I met in the whole of New York City, and we were like living underground, like we didn't want to tell our neighbors, because when we did start to tell our family and neighbors, they made fun of us, they yelled at us, they threatened to call social services on us, and my daughter was three. Wow. Three years old. That's... And they were saying, well, you're not going to school and, you know, you're an abusive family and you're neglectful. So it was not easy. But here's my advice to parents. The reason you think that it's normal to go to school is because you have been conditioned to believe that it's normal. But deep down inside, you know that it's not. Mm -hmm. You need to push through. It is going to be scary at first. I'm not going to say that it's not. Even if you live in a community that supports it, this is something that is going to be scary at first because you're going to say, okay, great, I'm unplugged. Now what? Mm -hmm. Because it's like if you're used to being plugged in your whole life, that's your lifeline. When somebody cuts that off, you freak out a little bit, and that's natural. That's normal. But you have to give yourself time, and you have to push through because once you – Get through a certain period of time. Once you build up your confidence, once you start building momentum and you get the resources that you need, it gets easier and easier and easier. And it gets to the point where you don't know how you lived any other way. Mm. It's been 10 years now, and I cannot imagine what my life would have been like if I would have stayed plugged in. I just simply can't imagine it because it's opened up so many other doors and our family is free in so many other ways. It's, it's just completely amazing. And it's been such a transforming experience. So you're going to be strange to your neighbors. You're going to be strange to your friends. I even offer a course on handling objections specifically to know how to deal with the people in your life that are going to give you grief over making this decision. Right. But it's so important that you do it. Why? Because it's worth it and your child is worth it. And the only other thing I'd like to offer parents is a lot of times we have this fear that we are not going to be able to provide a quality educational experience for our children. Number one, the only thing, the only reason you don't think you can do it is because you've been trained to believe that only the professionals can do it. You've been trained to believe that it's a very complicated process and it requires a, a degree in psychology in order to teach a child. Most parents are making this decision when their child is four, five, six years old. If you don't think you're equipped to teach your child the ABCs and the one, two, threes, then some real serious self-evaluation needs to be going on there. Right, because if right. you're a product of a 15-year system that supposedly educated you, then you should be able to teach the ABCs to your five-year-old. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. 
Oh, that's a really interesting, it's really interesting to hear about your experience. And I, I think that's really helpful. I, I wonder, do you, how important did you find it to find a community? Because you mentioned, you know, your initial experience in New York, and there's like five other people in the whole of New York. And, and I understand that you, you know, that you, you're very happy to have found that th this community that you, that, that is more homeschooling friendly, for want of a better word. Is that something that you feel was a really important thing for people to do to find sort of kindred spirits or, you know, is that? It is. It, I, I think it's very important because we, we are human beings and we are social creatures and it's nice, not necessarily to just stroke our ego and have people tell us that we're doing the right thing because that's, you know, I'm, that's kind of superficial. Mm. That's not really uh, what I'm talking about. I just want to clarify, I'll back up a second, then I'll go forward again. I want to clarify, there are more than five people in New York City that were home educating. Right. Uh, but in my, New York City is a big place. Yeah. In my area where I lived, um, I, I found a supportive group of parents that, you know, we kind of helped each other out. And there were only about five or six of us in that group. Yeah, you, um, you only had access to a small number. I of only had access to yeah, the I small understand. amounts, yeah. exactly. There were others all over the state, um, but I regularly only had access to that. And we were all kind of in the same boat. We were nervous. We were just getting started. But it's nice. What's nice about having the community support is that it just it helps you to not have to live like a fringe person. And a lot of people will say, oh, well, that's okay. I like living like a freak. I like living like a fringe person, you know, but that's, that's some kind of weird need to be different. Mm -hmm. I don't need to be different. I don't have like this uh, insatiable need for, you know, society to see me as, as strange and like Lady Gaga or whatever. Mm -hmm. I just want my family to be healthy. That's my goal. That's what I'm interested in. Okay. And it's important to know that you have the support of your community. Now, the thing that's good about the internet is that that you can find a lot of that support online. Right. If you don't want to leave where you're living and you don't feel that you're living in a, in a community that supports home education, the strict regulations or, or whatever there may be, you can find a community online and you could connect to people and really get great advice and great support and even form really close relationships with people that can support you and help you out and you support each other. But for the family, I think it's wise to either establish a community of home educating families where you live or find a community of home educating families because it really opens up your world to be able to go out into the 3D world outside of the internet and get together at gatherings mm. um, and have your children have access to. Now, of course, children make friends with anybody, whether they go to school or not. But it's nice that the children have access to other families where they don't feel like outsiders. Right. So right. they feel like, oh, hey, you know, there are other home educators out there and it's cool. The reason that I chose to move and I moved 1,400 miles away and one of the, t there were many reasons, there were a variety, but one of the very top reasons I chose this particular area to live in was because of its home education support and because there were so many other families here. I didn't want to constantly have to answer to somebody. I didn't want to constantly have to subject my kids to test taking by a school system that I rejected. I didn't want to constantly be surveilled and feel like I'm living like an outsider or a criminal. I wanted to be comfortable and I, owed that to my family. I felt my kids deserve to grow up in, an, in a place where they feel comfortable to be who they are. And that's why I moved here. And I love it because once I got here, I realized just how awesome it is. The public libraries run programs for home educating families. The public community centers run programs specifically for home educating families that they do during school hours mm -hmm. so we can have the facility to ourselves. Businesses that regular businesses, regular mainstream businesses, skating rinks, rec restaurants, uh, bookstores, um, the, the, the place that does the swim classes, uh, clothing stores, apparel stores, almost all the businesses out there, especially like the construction, like Lowe's and Home Depot, the local construction stores and, and houseware stores, they run specific programs for home educating families because wow. they know that there are so many of us here that we have become a market. Yeah, that's awesome. That sounds great. So there really is a lot of support. If you could tell someone where you are, oh, yeah, we're home educators, and you'll get that kind of, oh, my gosh, and that's crazy, that's strange. We tell someone here, or my kids meet kids at the park, and they make friends, and they say, what school do you go to? And my kids say, oh, we don't go to school. We're, we're, we do home education. And the kids shrug and go, oh, okay. Right, like, right. 
just completely normal and mainstream. The problem is I, I lose the cool factor of being different, but that, <laughs> that doesn't really matter to me. What matters to me is that my, my family grows up in an in a environment where they don't have to feel like they're constantly being pressured or watched. Mm, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's fantastic. You're right. I really appreciate you sharing your experiences about that because I think that, you know, it's really helpful for, uh, I find it really helpful to sort of see a bit of a, a roadmap about, you know, what kind of experiences um, uh, people can can prepare for and expect if, if they're considering this. And um, I do want to make sure that people can, you know, can get your resources. Your, your, um, your website is unpluggedmum.com. Is that right? Correct. Unpluggedmum.com. Awesome. And, and, also, I wanted to ask you, um, you know, are there other things that you have planned, things to look forward to? You know, do you have any other sort of uh, projects uh, in, in progress or what's coming up for you next? Well, the radio show has evolved. It's grown. We've been uh, on the air for almost two years. August will be two years. And in that time, it's it's grown Wonderfully, and I I couldn't be more more proud of what we've accomplished, and I'm also very humbled by it because it's 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 been the growth has been so wonderful and so unexpected, I guess, that I'm humbled by it. But mm. it's been going really well, and we've been trying to keep up with that growth, in 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 as much as I can to keep up with the growth because this, of course, my family always comes first. Um, so we've changed the formatting just a little bit. We've rearranged some things. We're going to have um, more podcasts coming out soon, and we have really exciting topics coming up. We're going to be talking about uh, sex and kids and uh, beauty image and consumerism having to do with uh, selling sex. We're going to be talking about feminism and the role that that plays coming up on Mother's Day. Mm -hmm. And We have a lot of different issues and a lot of different very exciting guests and different directors that we're going to be talking to coming up. The, we're also opening up something a little bit new that I don't want to give out too much information about, but I think by Monday we're going to be launching something new, uh, just a tremendous resource for parents looking to live outside of the box. We're going to have lots more resources on home education, but also resources on natural health and wellness and political activism and just living a, a kind of paradigm-free life and a dogma-free life. So uh, we have those exciting announcements coming up soon, but... The radio Fantastic. show is, has a lot to offer, and we're going to have more live question and answer shows. Yeah, I really like that. A paradigm-free life and a dogma-free life. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that's the idea. <laughs> yeah. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much, Lorette. I really appreciate you coming on the show and, uh, and sharing your thoughts about this really fantastic subject. Sure. I appreciate it, Jake. Thanks for having me on. Thanks. Thank you for listening to The Voluntary Life. If you have feedback about the show, please email jake at thevoluntarylife.com. If you enjoyed this program, please share the podcast with your friends or click the donate button on thevoluntarylife.com.